Hi guys, thank you for joining. This is Essence of Medicine. Today we're going to be talking about the economics of spine surgery. I'm Amanda Armagost. I'm Dr. Bossi for Essence, and we have a very special guest today. And I'm so proud and really honored to have a, a young surgeon who has brought a work um, in the economic of the spine that I, for years, have thought is extremely important. Dr. Sivganesan, is a, a, I would like you to introduce yourself and then, then I, we can talk about what we are going to talk about. Um, well, uh, uh, Hamid, Dr. Basi, thanks very much for having me uh, on your uh, uh, amazing platform. Um, my name is Ahilan Sivaganesan. Uh, I go by Siva um, or Dr. Siva with patients. Um, I'm a, a neurosurgeon at Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia. Um, my focus is on uh, minimally invasive uh, spine surgery and endoscopic spine surgery. Um, I'm in my, just started my third year in practice. Um, so I'm, uh, you know, relatively, uh, young in my career. Um, and I did my neurosurgical training at Vanderbilt. Um, and then I did a, a orthopedic spine fellowship at the hospital for, uh, for special surgery, HSS in New York city. Uh, and then made my way to Philadelphia. Um, and my passion, um, probably since the beginning of my surgical training has been around, um, outcomes and costs of, spine surgery and sort of surgical care in general and where that fits in terms of the the general landscape of healthcare today. Um, and I'm excited for the opportunity to talk about some of that in detail with you. So thanks for having me. Well, it's such a pleasure having you. I have been chasing you almost for a year to come and talk about this topic. And I'm going to first go through three slides and tell the patient, the people, the public, why is it important? Why should they listen to such an obscure thing like economic of the spine? Because I think it has impact on the individual life of each of us in our lifetime more than once. And I like to share the first screen here. And I'm not sure if it comes out well. This is a journal of Lancet, which is a very important journal that says that low back pain is now number one reason for disability. That is the main reason why people are disabled. So this is an epidemic. And the reason for that is very clear because population is getting older. It used to be like in 1990, spine was number four in United States and wasn't among top 10 in globally. In 2016, it was number two in United States and number four globally. And now, based on this study, is number one the reason for disability all around the world. So it is almost impossible not to have somebody who doesn't have spine problem. And I, this is something I use at, uh, around, and I say that by the time you are 70 years old, there's only one to 2% chance you don't have spine problem. Now, most of that we can solve without the surgery. And sometimes when we solve the problem, we just do it, you know, small incision and do it just a decompression and so on. But sometimes the problem is like a disc is like a tire of a car. Sometimes your disc look like that. Then more surgery is necessary. These surgeries are extremely invasive. These are uh, the, the outcome is sometimes even questionable, but it's still necessary. And we are not talking about the rare surgery. This is from Becker Spine that says. 1.62 million instrumented spinal fusions are performed annually in the United States. And most of that are still done open old-fashioned way. So I'm going to turn the, the microphone to somebody who's an expert in this. I watched uh, the, Dr. Siva's uh, presentation on a different platform, and I said I have to contact him and let him talk about why First of all, the spine surgeon, we have to take ownership of the problem. That's a problem because these are very frequently done surgeries, very expensive surgeries, very high acuity surgeries. There are lots of resources go into that. And his your conversation, Siva, was that mostly that we surgeons need to be aware of that. Yes. We have to understand that ourselves. Either we do it or it is forced upon us for a good reason. Right. And that, I think I'm paraphrasing you, but you use something to that effect that if you don't take care of it, other people are going to push it. People in suit are going to push them on us. That's yes. Yes. I love that. So yes. th th 
tell me, t- tell us. I mean, pl- this is your platform now. I want to public to know why should they know about this? Oh, perfect. Well, th- thank you very much for the introduction. I think that really set the stage. Um, I'm just going to share my screen um, so I can point to a couple slides just to add some add some color to uh, what we're discussing. So let me go ahead and share that. Bear with me here. Don't worry. Uh, Misha, I, I'm Charlie can cut this uh, pauses out. Don't oh, worry. good. Here we go. Okay. Can you see the slides okay there? Yes, we do. Um, so I think broadly, uh, as surgeons, we are very good at getting laser focused on sort of the nuts and bolts of what we do as technicians and physicians. Um, and we'll have debates about, you know, one technique versus another, anterior versus posterior, MIS versus open, this and that. And I think, you know, 95% of the energy we spend as a field is on answering those kinds of questions, you know, ACDF versus disc replacement, that sort of thing. Um, But if you think about sort of spine care more broadly, uh, and you imagine an entire patient's journey uh, through the entire healthcare process for a given spinal condition, we are a relatively small but important part of that bigger puzzle. And yet the costs associated with the care that we provide and the consequences of the care that we provide are very large. Um, And it occurred to me somewhere in the middle of my training that um, while we focus and we do a good job about looking at outcomes and, you know, uh, ODI and SF12 and MJOA and all these patient board outcomes, um, when we talk about value, which is sort of an overused buzzword today, value-based care, value is the outcomes achieved per dollar spent. And the denominator in that equation is sort of a footnote. We kind of gloss over it. Um, And so a few years ago, I started looking into sort of the literature to see what has really been done around really tracking and analyzing the costs of our care. And I came to a pretty, you know, startling realization. And a lot of it came from a seminal uh, publication from the Harvard Business Review uh, by Michael Porter and Robert Kaplan, uh, and it's called How to Solve the Cost Crisis, where they essentially said quite bluntly that healthcare is one of the few industries or businesses in Western civilization where the main stakeholders don't actually understand the true costs of the services that they provide. Uh, and because of various unique attributes of the way healthcare is paid for in this country and many other countries, um, hospitals, physicians, practices have been able to sort of, quote unquote, get away with not truly understanding the actual costs of care. Um, But that is changing. As we all know, and in one of the slides you showed, the costs of care are are rising faster than inflation. It's a big reason for bankruptcy in this country and in other countries. And so the question then becomes, uh, in any sort of quality improvement uh, initiative, in any hospital, there's a mantra, which is that, you can't improve something if you're not measuring it, right? And you may ask you, you choose that title, lifting the veil for a reason. Yes, yes. It's almost, I get the feeling that there is truly a veil, something that obstructs the view to look into this. And, yes. and uh, when there is a veil, there's always an intention. I almost feel an intention that there are some players here that they do want the veil still to be there. What do you I, think? Uh, that's a great question. So, um, you know, uh, from a surgeon standpoint, um, we, let's be honest, you know, if a, there are certain institutions that have a great reputation, right? Like if a university has a great reputation for, co- for college and you want to send your kids to that university, uh, Ivy League or what have you, we may all assume that uh, the surgeons at that institution must be the best. Right. Um, uh, Or if, 
uh, a surgeon or a hospital is in your network for your insurance plan. You may decide that that surgeon or that hospital must be one of the best, and that's why they're in network for your insurance plan. But there is a entire sort of layer of opaqueness there where in every other aspect of our lives, we as patients or customers or consumers demand to know exactly what we are going to gain uh, with various choices we make, whether it's the phone we buy, the car we buy, um, uh, or, or th th this or that. But when it comes to healthcare, and in particular surgical care, if my mother, you know, God forbid, needed a hip replacement, and I wanted to know, uh, uh, you know, who uh, she's achieving the best outcomes at the lowest cost for a hip replacement in, in the area that my mother lives in, my ability to get that information, even as someone in the medical field, is very poor. And I may sort of make a phone call to someone that I know at that hospital and say, hey, who's really good for this procedure? But even they may not know because they're going off of some reputation. Oh, he's published a lot. You know, he's always at the national conferences. He's president of the society. But maybe what matters most to my mother is return to work. Or maybe what matters is, you know, readmission rate or reoperation rate. Yeah. Certain metrics that are specific to her condition and the kind of surgery that she's considering. Those specific outcomes are not available in any sort of transparent way to the public or even to employers or to payers. Um, and the dollars associated with it, you know, uh, the surprise medical bills and everything that comes across from that, the, all these things are sort of, you could argue in a way, deliberately a little bit vague and unclear and we have sort of we don't know any we don't know any alternate reality. So we're all sort of used to it. And we just we just take it. Um, but I think, you know, as patient care becomes more uh, sort of patient centric and patients take more ownership and have the ability to sort of uh, demand knowledge, a lot of this uh, knowledge asymmetry is going to go away. And the surgeons and the hospitals and the practices that sort of are proactive and actually uh, present this information to the various stakeholders are going to do very well. And those that sort of rest on the laurels of reputation of the institution or historical referral patterns are going to be sort of caught blind. Yeah. So I'm really excited to go over your slides, uh, uh, Siva. But uh, so t t tell me just a trivia. I have heard that the best place to understand if you are getting really treated well or not, ask the nurses of the hospital, not the doctors of the hospital, but the right. nurses of the hospital, because they do take care of the patient after the surgeon is done with them. Have you yeah. heard that before? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, the nurses, and it's interesting, you know, uh, uh, the nurses in the operating room are probably the best source of information for that phase of care. And then the, 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 the nurses on the wards, they'll yes. know how often does that surgeon actually come and round on the patients and you know, spend time and, you know, uh, talk to the family. So I, I think they're really the boots on the ground. I think that's that's very true. <laughs> I've heard that as well. Well, that is that that is funny you say that because I always round on my own patient. And yes. I, I found out that sadly that I'm the only surgeon on the weekend who runs on his own patient. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. So, right. so that's true. Then the nurses, they talk about that. I noticed yes. that they do talk about that. that yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So that's uh, what they, they laid on us. I'm so excited. The excitement is killing me now. All right. Let's get started then. <laughs> so um, I'll sort of start with this slide because I think it sort of captures a lot of what we're discussing. Um. So as we just, as we mentioned earlier, you know, value is defined as the outcomes achieved per dollar spent. And there's a lot of talks and publications and energy around different versions of value-based care, whether it's a bundled payments or population health-based reimbursements, uh, pay for performance, there are all these different versions. But what occurred to me is that if we wanna get serious about value-based care, we need to have the ability to measure the value that individual surgeons are delivering for patients for specific diagnoses for specific surgeries. Uh, and to be honest, I don't think that in spine and in general in the surgical 
field as a whole, that we have really done a good job at even attempting this. So what would that look like in spine surgery? So what I what I did here at Jefferson is, is I said, okay, let's take a surgery that is relatively homogeneous, uh, where there is not a terrible amount of variation that one would think, but from surgeon to surgeon in terms of the choices they make uh, and the technique they use. Uh, now, obviously, you know, even if you take a laminectomy and you talk to 10 surgeons, they're probably going to do it 10 different ways, um, but there's a spectrum. And so we chose one level ACDFs, anterior cervical decompression infusion. Which is the after... surgery, if I may just uh, delay. Oh, please. It is when your disc in your spine in the neck is a bad disc. And then we go from the front, heads anterior, cervical meaning the neck, discectomy meaning to getting the bad disc out, and then fusion meaning that putting a spacer in, putting a small metal plate and screw. This is a very common procedure. This is a good procedure. We know it's working. And that is, you chose it because I know what you described. It is commonly performed and more or less it's unified. The approach is unified. Please go ahead. Oh, thank you for thanks for that explanation. So um, the question then became um, if value equals outcomes achieved per dollar spent, let's pick a standard outcome that is relevant for patients undergoing this procedure. And in this case, we picked the neck disability index, which is a validated uh, outcome uh, for patients with these kind of conditions. Uh, and then let's also look at the true intraoperative cost uh, for this procedure when done by the surgeons at our hospital. And let's do something which I believe has not been done before in the spine or neurosurgical orthopedics literature, uh, which is to combine the outcome scores with the cost data into a unified visualization. And so that's what we attempted to do in this plot. So I'll take you through this plot. Each bubble here is an individual surgeon. The size of the bubble corresponds to how many of this particular surgery that surgeon performed in the last year. Beautiful graph, by the way. I love this graph. So oh, thank you. Yeah. The y-axis is that outcome metric I mentioned, the, the neck disability index. And it's particularly the improvement in that score from before surgery to three months after surgery. And you can replace that metric with arm pain, uh, satisfaction, what have you. So this is the average improvement score for each surgeon uh, on the y-axis. And the x-axis is the true intraoperative cost. Now, I'll get into more detail about how we accomplish this, but I think it is important to mention that, you know, most accountants in hospitals will say, well, yeah, we, we have the cost data. You know, uh, I can show that to you. Uh, I know which, you know, we know which implants were used and uh, we know uh, which consumables were used. And so we can give you that information. But it's interesting. Uh, one of the most important observations from that Harvard Business Review article was that, when most people talk about costs in healthcare, they're actually talking about charges or they're talking about reimbursements or they're talking about collections. And what they usually do is they do some sort of arithmetic, some sort of calculation to sort of back estimate the actual true cost of care from the charges uh, or from the RVUs or reimbursements or collections, which has been shown systematically to be an inaccurate way of actually tracking true costs. And the methodology that has been proposed as sort of the gold standard for cost, not just in healthcare, but in any sort of industrial process, is something called time-driven activity-based costing. And it's a quite simple, actually. It just means that you create a process map for any given encounter, whether it's a clinic visit or an operating room, and you you basically document every personnel and material resource that is interacting with the patient. So in the operating room, that means the circulating nurse, the radiation tech. Uh, if you're using an O-arm, it's the O-arm and the indirect and direct expenses for that. Every sterile towel that you open, every implant, uh, every, every tray that you open and the sterilization costs associated with that. So you can imagine you create a process map for uh, any given encounter like a surgery and you track all the personnel and material resources, you measure the time that that resource has been applied to that patient, and you also calculate the dollars per minute for that resource. So if it's, for example, a, circ a circulating nurse, if that nurse is employed by the hospital, they may be paid at a certain rate. If they're a traveling nurse, they may be paid at three times that rate. Um, if it's a radiation tech, they may have a certain dollars per minute. 
But if you use five minutes of fluoroscopy, that's a different time time and cost calculation than if you use one minute of fluoroscopy. So this is a methodology that is quite accurate. But yeah. historically, the the weakness of this methodology is that it has historically required either medical students or research nurses with a clipboard basically shadowing the patient through every step of the clinical encounter and calculating how many minutes they spent with each person and so on and so forth. So now, if I may, uh, um, if, uh, about six years ago for our study, we looked into that. At that time, the average minute, that is was truly almost scary. If, at, at six years ago, one minute in the OR was calculated to cost $65 to $94 per minute. Now imagine this is, we are talking about lots of experienced, very well-educated people who have to get paid and a war alone, it costs millions of dollars to build yes. a campaign. Yes. So, um, but, but, so next time you're in the war and you're there for seven hours or something, yes. you know, it really costs to the system to put you through that. So please, Absolutely. to interrupt you, go ahead. That's a, no, that's a great point. Um, so what we were able to do, and this has sort of been sort of the, the passion project of mine over the last year or so, is to say, um, can we automate this time-driven activity-based costing methodology and build it into and uh, couple it with the electronic medical record so that we don't need to have a team of research personnel to accomplish this? Because I'm interested in this becoming a scalable thing that you know a private practice can do, you can do at a surgery center, and you can't, it's not realistic to have a team of research personnel for anything like this. So we were able to build a, a, a data infrastructure to be able to automate the tracking of, uh, of this cost in the operating room and then merge it with our prospective outcomes registry to be able to generate a visualization like this. Um, and even though it's a simple plot, it, it's actually in a way somewhat profound because for the first time, we can actually do a value-based comparison of surgeons for a given diagnosis for a given procedure. So this is just one level ACDFs for radiculopathy. And you can see here that there are certain surgeons that on average are achieving high outcome scores at a very low cost. They're in the upper left quadrant of this plot. And there I are other see, surgeons. I apologize. I see those please. surgeons that are very angry with your research. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's right. And, and then there are surgeons that are achieving lower outcomes at higher costs, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so the and, and I think this is important because when hospitals try to cut costs, what they will do is they will say, okay, we don't want you to use uh, that flow seal anymore. Uh, we don't want you to use that expandable cage or this or that. But it's only good to cut costs if you're all if you're maintaining or improving outcomes at the same time. And to be able to do that, you need to be able to track the outcomes with the cost. So you can imagine with a sort of a data visualization structure like this, say at Jefferson, we decided to standardize all our ACDFs to structural allograft, which is essentially a, you know, synthetic bone instead of a metal cage, uh, you know, for the lay audience. Or we decided to say, um, you know, we're only going to use uh, BMP, which is an expensive uh, biological compound that we use to achieve, help achieve a bony fusion when we do spine surgery. Um, that's nice. Uh, if you just look at the cost, you'll say, wow, you'll be high-fiving in six months. Wow, look at how we brought our cost down. But what if the reoperation rate goes up? Uh, or what if the length of stay goes up? Or readmission rates go up for any, any of these uh, initiatives you undertake? Um, by tracking the outcomes alongside the costs, you could imagine a new version of this plot in six months, and the bubbles have drifted. And say more of the bubbles have moved into the upper left quadrant where the outcomes are staying the same or improving and the costs have gone down to the left on the x-axis. That sort of migration of the bubbles towards the upper left quadrant is the goal for, I think, any practice, any surgeon. Uh, and so that's the kind of uh, uh, mentality and the kind of initiative that we're trying to achieve. Um, and, it, and, and this plot, I think, captures some of that. Um, and, you know, one thing that I'm particularly passionate about is that, you know, it's one thing to... Uh, try to reduce costs and improve outcomes for a given surgery. But if you look at the health policy environment right now, what's really going to happen is that they're not going to do bundled payments just for a procedure. They're going to do it for a diagnosis. 
And what that means is it's not just going to be, okay, uh, Dr. Bhatti, um, you're going to do a T-lift procedure. You get $20,000 from CMS. And, uh, you know, hopefully you can keep your cost under that and keep the savings. But if you go over that cost, you're going to lose money. You know, that's what we think of when we think of bundled payments. But what's going to come soon is something called condition-based bundled payments, where the payers are going to say, okay, this patient has a diagnosis of neurogenic claudication and lumbar stenosis. Okay, we've decided that you as a practice or as a health system are going to get $30,000 over the next three years to take care of this condition. And if you can get that patient better with non-surgical means, that's great. If you feel that they need to get surgery to achieve a good outcome, that's fine. But that's going to come out of this lump sum that we've decided to pay you. Suddenly, if it's based on a condition instead of a procedure, it's going to start changing surgical decision making. And this is the part that we don't like to talk about much as surgeons. But, you know, one common, you know, one powerful procedure in certain patients is a cervical phrenotomy, right? It's not ideal for every patient, but for the lay audience, it's, it's a procedure that does not involve putting any metal in your neck. It's basically a clean out procedure that certain patients uh, with a certain type of nerve pinching can be a candidate for. Surgeons in the current day get reimbursed less to do that procedure than they do uh, if they do some sort of fusion operation. And most surgeons are extremely ethical. They're trying to do right by patients, but we're all human and there's behavioral economics at play. And there's a reason that a uh, cervical phrenotomy is not incredibly popular in this current day and age. Very true. But, but let's imagine that on this plot, the title was not value-based comparison of surgeons for one level ACDF, but it was value-based comparison of surgeons for cervical radiculopathy. Now, if you're a surgeon that is uh, uh, eager to perform cervical phrenotomies on appropriate patients, and those patients are doing well after surgery, the costs of your surgery on average are going to be significantly less than a surgeon who does an ACDF for every patient with cervical radiculopathy. And so your cost profile will be significantly less because you are introducing a low cost surgery into the mix because there are no implants associated with it and perhaps the surgical time is faster, so on and so forth. So why I bring this up is that it's important for us as surgeons to do these analyses at the level of the condition and the diagnosis um, because that will give us the opportunity to do the least expensive, least invasive surgery that achieves a good result. And it's the way that we are going to be analyzed by payers and employers in the future. And to the point that you made at the beginning, you know, if you've ever had a conversation with someone in middle management or a hospital administrator or someone from, you know, an insurance company, we all have the same feeling. They don't know the first thing about spine surgery. They don't know the first thing about the nuances of the conditions. Many of them have never sought and sat in front of a patient and actually talked to them about how it's affecting their day-to-day -day life. And instead of having the people in the boardroom make these analyses for us without understanding any of that nuance, I think it's important for us as a field to really uh, uh, roll up our sleeves and generate this data and make it transparent internally and externally um, so that these analyses can be done in a way that does right by our patients and does right by us as a field. Yep, exactly. And that's, I think, very in your presentation, you used that if you don't do it, the, the people in the suit is going to just shove it down our throat. That's right. That's right. That's <laughs> right. Um, so uh, just to give you an idea of, I, I think, the power of this costing methodology, you know, a lot of these health systems are merging, as you know, and yep. they're buying up local hospitals and becoming more uh, uh, conglomerates so that they have more purchasing power. And so Jefferson is no exception. You know, we have now, I think, almost 20 hospitals in our system. So what we did is we said, OK, let's let's divide up uh, the surgeons by the locations in which they do surgery. So each box on the X axis here is a different surgical site within the Jefferson Enterprise. And the bubbles, again, represent individual surgeons at each of those sites. And you can see that there is a significant amount of variation in the true cost interoperatively for one level ACDF between surgeons in a given site and across sites. And why I think this type of analysis is important is that, to be honest with you, I think very soon it's not gonna be sustainable for quaternary large hospital systems to do microdiscectomies, even one level ACDFs, lumbar decompressions 
at these major hospital systems. And you're leading the way with this, with your outpatient surgery that you're doing and pioneering even lumbar fusions in an outpatient setting. And so this kind of analysis uh, will show that there are clearly certain sites of service where certain types of surgeries are low cost. And if hospitals are getting paid the same amount of money to do a given procedure, they are going to want to move those cases to the place where they can maintain outcomes at the lowest cost possible. Um, and I think this kind of visualization is, a, is an example of sort of that, that move that's happening. And uh, surgeons need to be aware of this thing so that we can also sort of appropriately place cases in the, in the right place. Um, this is just an example of, you know, taking all the other factors out of looking at every surgeon at Jefferson who does a reasonable volume of one level ACDFs and look, looking at the cost variation. And it's quite striking. Um, I mean, there's a surgeon here that's at about, uh, you know, that doesn't do that much volume at about $4,000, but the lowest cost high volume surgeon is at about, you know, $4,500, $4,800 per case. And then there are surgeons that are at almost $9,000. No, that's a almost. May I ask, you know, Please. I see most of those big volume, bigger circles, I see them more accumulated on the lower cost. And I see on the, uh, on the, the yes. more expensive part, I see smaller, lower volume. Can you yes. explain that? Yeah, it's a great question. We're actually looking to publish that particular observation uh, uh, by doing sort of a risk adjusted analysis to look at that question. Um, but you know, I think we all anecdotally know that, you know, practice makes perfect. And the more of something you do, the more standardized you become. Uh, and uh, as you start iterating on your own techniques through doing high volume, you your outcomes get better. That we kind of all know. What this is suggesting, and we've actually shown this now and soon to be published, is that it's not just that the outcomes get better. It's also that the costs go down. Um, and there's various theories for why this is. Um, one is that when you do something only so often, you may be experimenting with, well, let me try this expandable cage today, or let me try that. Um, whereas when it's something that you do every week, every month, you will are much more likely to have fine tuned and refined your workflow and mastered what works in your hands. Yeah. And just standardization alone leads to cost reductions. Yeah. Um, I as well, I would like to you know if you, if you have the data, if you know how much of that being more price efficient or cost efficient is based on the surgeon is just utilizing the whole OR for an hour rather than four hours. And how much of that is that he's using a device that is four times or four times more or less than the other device? What yes. is the impact of the OR efficiency versus material that's all used? Yes, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, uh, it, as you might expect for surgeries that involve implants, um, the choice of implants and uh, the choice of consumables, things like, um, you know, for a lumbar case, like an Aquamantis or, uh, you know, Flow Seal, things like that um, uh, are a big piece of it. And for surgeries that don't involve implants, the biggest factor is speed. The biggest factor is speed. And even in implant oh, wow. surgeries, speed is a big factor. No, um, and it, you, you use two words I want to explain to people. Please. The flow seal is a, a thrombin, a part of our blood practically that it's produced synthetically. We mix it with particles that goes in and stop the bleeding. Aquamantis, it, it is not an animal. It is practically a 120 volt electricity that cooks your tissue, like literally when you are using it, your spine muscle turn into a steak, a medium yeah. rare or, or well done steak, depending on how long you hold it there. It is necessary in some surgeries to stop the bleeding. It adds, Aquamantis by itself sometimes adds to the efficiency because then you stop the bleeding, but then down the road, it may cause more infection because you have more dead tissue and more mm -hmm. stability because you're destroying more tissue and so on. So these are very complex situation that efficiency in one area may add to more infection and take back to surgery. And your job well done is accommodating for all those factors to have the true cost of a procedure. So please. Right, go. right. 
No, thanks. Yeah. Um, and that's the kind of thing. Uh, thanks for bringing that up is that, you know, uh, when 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 accountants look at the costs of a case, they look at the things that are easy to measure, what implants were used. But we know that things like speed and all these little choices we make about different tools that we use also account for the total cost. And that's what we're trying to capture here. Um, and there's a phrase that I really like, which is that variation is a is evidence of an unevolved system. And if that's the case, healthcare is a very unevolved system because even when we choose what we think is the most standardized of all spinal fusion cases, a one level ACDF, you're seeing almost a three X variation in the true intraoperative cost of the procedure. And so you can imagine how much variation there would be in a T10 to pelvis uh, or in other surgeries that where there is an incredible amount of variation in the way that surgeons attack the problem and the techniques that they use. Um, if I may, please. this is what I heard you correct me if I'm wrong. Even though there are many factors involved here, the efficiency of the surgery is the main contributor to make the surgery lower cost or higher cost. Is that That's correct? a huge factor. Yes, it's a huge I'd factor. Like to actually, uh, just show you one slide. If please. I may. Yes, let me let me uh, end my uh, share here. Yes. One and Jeff, I want to just show that that being efficient by itself, as well as a, can influence the outcome. This is a study based on, uh, I'm not sure if you are able to see that now. Yes. So this is a study based on about 400,000 cases, meta-analysis of many different procedures that they show every additional half an hour, 30 minutes on the anesthesia overall, at 17% to the combine of the risk of the surgery. Yeah. What, but the map, the way it worked out, and the, for people who are interested, the reference is right down here. If you put all the surgeries above two hours and all the surgeries that are below two hours, you're doubling the complication rate with that. Now I'm going to unshare and please reshare your sure. screen because what your slide is now saying that those surgeons with the higher volume, they are not only cheaper, but based on this study, but they as well have lower complication rate. Yes. Tremendously lower complication rate. Right. And I think actually our next slide, let me... Uh... So this is a, a nice segue. This is only looking at the time of the surgery now. Um, and you can see there that, you know, there's a surgeon that's quite high volume that averages about two hours for this surgery. And this by this by time, we are looking at doors in to doors out um, because that's what really matters in terms of OR utilization. Uh, and then there are surgeons at the top that it's about four hours, right, for one level ACDF. And so this goes to show that, you know, how much variation there is in time. And, time, and that's why I love time-driven activity-based costing because it puts time at the center of, of, of what is affecting costs overall. Um, you know, I, I, that, I love that. I love that slide because I know you and I have met some surgeon that they say, you know, it's not about the speed and we never say it's about the speed, but you showed this slide and I showed that slide that even though it's not about the speed by reducing the, just the, the, the by reducing the steps, by Efficiency, yes. increasing the efficiency, not only you making the surgery safer, but you yes. are making the surgery as well more cost effective. Yes. And when the surgeon that they, 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 they come and say it doesn't time doesn't matter, my answer to them is talk to the anesthesiologist. Right, right. Absolutely. Not. Please go ahead. And, and, and I'll make a point, you know, uh that hopefully relates to you know a lot of the pioneering work you're doing, Hamid, which is that you know. If you take a traditional open surgeon, um, you know, some of them may say, you know, they may come out and brag and they may say, you know what, my T lift, uh, my T lift takes 35 minutes, right? But what they really mean, especially if they're in an academic center, is that, um, okay, the resident or the fellow did the exposure, they started the decompression, then the <laughs> attending surgeon walks in, you know, they do the facetectomy, put the cage in, maybe put the screws in, and then, and then they walk out and they said, oh, yeah, my T lift took 35 minutes, right? But <laughs> 
but there were maybe there was an, a 45 minutes for the exposure. Maybe there was a 45 minutes for the closure. And because the attending surgeon may or may not have been in the room for positioning or for the closure. And so everyone's sort of uh, that time is not accounted for in that my the 35 minute T lift that I'm doing. Right. Um, the transcambin uh, O lifts that you're doing, uh, there is no exposure. There's very small closure. Uh, you're doing it, I'm guessing, the very standardized way every single time. So the team knows exactly what to do. They know where the instruments are, all that. So the time for the entire case gets compressed. Yes. And, and we always that's the kind of... into skin time because, yes. as you just said, it doesn't matter the part that just the surgeon does or resident opens and closes. Yes, and so on. yes. It's, it's, the, it's the procedure time. And more broadly, it's the doors in, doors out time, right? And, and so doors, um, doors out, doors in, doors out for the cost part, total yes. anesthesia time for, for the, the outcome, for the outcome. Yes, absolutely. absolutely, absolutely. And I think that's a message that gets lost a little bit when uh, uh, when 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 people compare different sources of procedures and new pioneering techniques and things of that nature. Um, so uh, this is just to give you an idea of the granularity that we can achieve with this sort of cost tracking methodology that, that we've, we've come up with where it's not enough to just look at total costs, right? Because if I show you a graph and I show you significant variation in costs from surgeon to surgeon, the next question is, okay, what's the driver of that cost? Uh, what is surgeon X doing that maybe the rest of us can learn from? Uh, or what is surgeon Y doing that um, we can tweak to actually cut down the time or the outcomes in a, in a certain way. And so it's very important to be able to drill down and identify the drivers of that variation so that we can then make some actions based on that. And so that's, it's to that end that we started subdividing the types and drivers of the cost. So when it comes to the cost of one little ACDF, you can divide that in supply costs and personnel costs. And then you can look at the personnel and you can actually get incredibly granular and you say, OK, who was a circulating nurse in that operating room? How much did we pay that circulating nurse dollars per minute times the number of minutes? Some 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 surgeons have four people helping in the operating room. They have a fellow, they have a resident, they have a first assist. Uh, that's all cost. Right. Um, and if you radiation tech as well, uh, how much time are they spending in the operating? Room? All this matters. And if you're trying to get lean, if you're trying to do surgeries in a surgery center, all of this matters. And so what we found, which was quite fascinating, is that no one surgeon happened to be the best at everything from a cost profile. Some surgeons use the lowest cost implants. Some surgeons were the most cost conscious when it came to consumables. Some surgeons were, you just, just give me a skin knife and a first assist or just a scrub tech and I'm good to go, right? So we all have something to learn which is a good thing. Um, and if you were to trace a line from one bubble to that same bubble across these different verticals, you will see that the lines all become zigzagged because everyone's good and bad at something. And so it just, it just <laughs> lends to the point that by creating transparency around this data and showing this to a group practice or a department, surgeons mm -hmm. are competitive, right? Uh, but right now, surgeons only compete on the metrics that you show them. Right. And if the only metric is RVUs or case numbers, they're going to compete on that. But if you show them true cost data at the personnel level or the supply level with the associated outcomes, you'll get surgeons to compete on those metrics. Yes. And those are the metrics that are the best for society and the best for patients. So, so you know, I'm looking at this and I see a future that then, you know, we are developing our own artificial intelligence system and it's amazing what it can do. I'm seeing in the future that the artificial intelligence says this surgeon should work with this anesthesiologist and this scrub tech and this radiation technology because based on my data, the combination of these four give the best result optimal. and the optimum results. So yes. it's amazing when you have the data and, and my hat up to you, you do have the data. Once you have the data, the possibilities of using them is endless. Yeah, no, I, thanks for that. I think you're right. And as spine surgeons, when we talk about AI or robotics or what have you, we always focus on the use of these technologies to help with screw placement or cage placement or alignment. But you're absolutely right. Um, 
these technologies, whether it's AI or, or machine learning, are going to be applied to the entire care process, not just the specific technical details of the surgery. And um, uh, if you don't have the data, you're not going to be able to take advantage of these of these new these new uh, capabilities that are that are coming about very fast. Um, so this is now a look at just the supply cost version of things. Um, as we mentioned, there's the implants, there's consumables, there's sterilization. This is another point that I think you brought up, which is that if you do a surgery only once a month, the staff doesn't know exactly how you like it. Um, they may say, well, you know what? Um, he might need that specials tray. So let's just open it up just in case so that the rep doesn't get yelled at. You know, um, everyone's trying to trying to do something just to protect themselves. And let's open everything we possibly need, might need. But if you do something the same way every time, four times a week or eight times a week, it's going to be refined. And the number of trays you open are going to be less. And there is a severe cost to the number of trays and instruments you open, which you can see here, which is that even for a one level ACDF, there is a 3x variation in the sterilization costs uh, for something as simple as a one level ACDF. That and this is amazing. Uh, this is amazing that, you know, uh, people don't realize even in a, we just is called just in a one level ACDF. It's a very technical procedure. Sure. The amount of the things that have to be available in the war to be able to do that. Just was in Florida. We were doing multiple lumbar surgeries in a surgery center. The room wasn't big enough to have seven sets. Being a regular spinal fusion, you have seven sets. We could do that surgery there because we opened only two sets, two boxes, wow. and that was enough. If we had to open seven sets, the sterilization and just the space you would need that would prevent us to, us being able to do that in that surgery center. Yeah. And knowing, just knowing that what you just described, how much material one surgeon versus another needs to do the same kind of surgery or familiarity of the system that Am I going to open five sets because I don't know which one I'm going to use? Or right. maybe I can help me to see again in the future. You yes. Open the box one and two and three, but have the box five and six and seven outside of the door and box nine and ten. Don't even think about that. Yes. So, but again, having the data is going to be a huge driver of our behavior in the future. So, again, add. No, that, that, thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. Um, and so I, it's important to be able to drill down um, and then you can go even deeper, right? If you go into implants, you know, in this example, human tissue is bi biologics. Uh, then you have the cages, the screws, bone graft ascenders. Even for a, a one level ACDF, there's a 4X difference um, from, surgeon, from, from the minimal into the maximum surge in terms of the costs associated with uh, the biologics, right? And so this is the opportunity at this level of data to actually go in and say, okay, you don't have to mandate something. You can say, let's let's have a conversation about why Surgeon X is using, you know, this much of this expensive uh, uh, product and other surgeons are not. And you can do a pilot study. You can say, let's for six months, let's uh, all standardize the use of this. Let's look at the outcomes and look at the costs. And if the outcomes are the same or better with this initiative, then we make that permanent. If we're suffering on some way in terms of the outcomes, then we'll dial it back. This sort of, uh, so that's what that's what excites me about this is that there's this notion of something called a learning healthcare system where you have data and it becomes a plug and play infrastructure so you can trial an initiative. If it improves value, you make it permanent. If it doesn't, you rewind. And this is how you can continually improve uh, and, you know, achieve, you know, better outcomes at a lower cost. Um, so this is a, uh, the details aren't, aren't important here, but, uh, but what's important with this table is what I essentially did is I said, okay, let's imagine a hypothetical imaginary surgeon who makes the lowest cost choices across every dimension of care that we have tracked here. The lowest cost implants, the lowest personnel profile in the operating room, the lowest cost in, uh, consumables. And let's see what the cost of that surgery hypothetically would be. And let's compare that to the median cost of all the surgeries that we tracked. And if you multiply that cost difference between the hypothetical minimal cost and the median cost and multiply it by the number of surgeons, uh, surgeries that happen in say two months at a large hospital, how much cost savings could we theoretically uh, uh, enjoy? 
And that analysis came out to about almost $300,000. Wow. And that was for just 80 cases. So in a large, you know, busy health system, maybe that's even one or two months or three months of, 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 of cases. So the reason I did this is because generating this kind of data infrastructure takes an investment. Um, and the question is, uh, is it the juice worth the squeeze? What's the return on this investment? And you can see here that simply by standardizing some basic things, you may not get to 300,000 because it's possible that that hypothetical lowest cost surgery is also low outcomes, right? Because of the cheapest care is no care, right? So, um, <laughs> but there is, a, there is a sweet spot though, where you can reduce costs safely and maintain or improve outcomes. And this is just a showing the power of what this kind of um, methodology done at scale can do for just one type of procedure. And you can imagine expanding that to uh, all different types of spine surgery and other types of surgery as well. Um, Siva, I, 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 this is the right time for me to say, you know, I, I really admire your work here because many, many years ago, I did something similar. I would like to share two slides Please. here as well. And those slides are exactly along what you just described. You get it. Obviously, this is theoretical. So we did a theoretical, uh, no, the, we did an economic. My first paper for Olaf was not a technical paper. It was an economic paper about what does it do. And our theoretic, theoretic calculation, after you calculate everything together, in 2016 was that if you do the calculation and change all the spinal fusion to MIS, the Olaf way, the wow. critical saving would be $3.4 billion in the United States, wow. be billion, not million dollar. And, and the math adds up, obviously you cannot really do all of those surgeries. Sure, of course. MIS and we, there are certain surgeries that still have to be open, but we are, everybody complains about the cost of healthcare and so on. And I want to emphasize here, this, even though you are telling this is theoretical. This is going to make our healthcare make or break in the next mm -hmm. 20 years. So yes. fantastic work. Please uh, reshare and continue. It's yeah. exciting. So I have, uh, I think, two more slides. Um, let's see here. Can you see, uh, can you see this here? Yes, sir, I do. Okay. So, um, Obviously, everything we've been talking about so far is laser focused on the individual operating room episode. Um, uh, we were fortunate enough to get a grant from the Cervical Spine Research Society uh, to essentially ask the question, can we apply this cost tracking methodology, not just in the operating room, but for the entire episode of care where a patient gets surgery? So from the moment the patient is scheduled for surgery in clinic, to the moment they leave the hospital at discharge. Because when it comes to a surgical practice or a hospital system, the real question becomes, what is the true cost, say, for Jefferson Health to execute a surgical episode for a one-level MIST lift? It's not just the operating room cost. It's not just even the post-operative costs. When your administrator has to do a peer-to-peer -peer with Aetna, and that takes, say, 45 minutes. There's a dollar per minute cost associated with that admin making that phone call. Uh, and when that surgical scheduler is talking with the patient and counseling them on all the pre-admission testing, all these, these things go into and are baked into the true cost of delivering that surgical episode. And similarly, post-operatively, looking at length of stay alone is not enough. Did a nutritionist come to see that patient on post-op day one? Was there a physical therapist that spent uh, 45 minutes doing a session with that patient on post-op day one? Um, was there a surgeon or a PA or an NP rounding on that patient on post-op day one? All of those things need to be captured in the true cost of that overall episode. So we were able to get a grant and, and show that we were able to do this sort of work and we'll be publishing that soon. But it, it begs the question of what if we keep zooming out? And this is what this slide is about. What we did here, and I have to thank um, some of the medical students at uh, Jefferson for putting this together, is what we asked a question, which is we said, let's take a patient who got all of their care through our health system at Jefferson. And we have uh, one of the major electronic medical records, Epic. And we said, let's create a visual of the entire patient journey 
from the moment that patient got diagnosed with a spinal condition to the day that they got surgery. And that visual is what you see here. So you can see just from the slide how much of a maze this process was for this patient. First, they get diagnosed by their PCP, then they get sent to neurosurgery. Neurosurgery says you haven't tried any non-surgical things yet. They get sent back to the PCP, then they get sent to uh, uh, physical, uh, physical medicine rehabilitation. They do PT, they get sent for new scans, they go to radiology, uh, something doesn't get approved, they go to the, they go to the insurance company. And they find out they have another comorbidity. They go back to medicine. And then finally, they were, they were, they were back to neurosurgery. And eventually, they get surgery. This experience is something that we all have direct knowledge of, either ourselves or our friends and family, that healthcare is a maze, right? And why is this relevant? Is because we then asked our team and most of the medical students to come up with an alternate universe. What if we could redesign the story for this patient? What would the path have ideally been? And just by the visual, you can tell that it's a much more straightforward process of going to the right place at the right time to get the right care. Sometimes that leads to surgery eventually, and sometimes that doesn't. But we saved hundreds of days of the patient's journey by reimagining this, this, this story for this patient. And the question is, well, why is this important? Well, as healthcare changes and CMS and the payers and the employers start really caring, it's not enough that you have a rock star surgeon at your practice, your hospital, who can do a really great T lift for ACDF or whatever. What's really going to matter is, are you a system that can get the patient to the right place at the right time for the right treatment? And why is this going to be, uh, why are we all going to be held accountable for this? Is because eventually, like I said before, what I believe is that the payers and the employers are going to say, my, my employee or my patient has this condition. And if I am a big employer, I want to get my patient, my, my employee back to work as fast as possible. Maybe that involves surgery, maybe it doesn't. But all I care about is getting this patient back to functionality as fast as possible with the least amount of dollars spent. And so suddenly the system has to be adept at routing the patient appropriately. Um, and, you know, right now the systems are not geared up for this. And why is that? Well, the pain doc want to maximize all their interventions. The surgeons are trying to maximize their interventions. The primary care docs are trying to see as many patients as possible. We're all in our individual silos trying to maximize our own productivity yeah. instead of integrating to get the patient to the right place at the right time in the shortest path possible. But, but so, there's so many other people involved in each of those levels. Do you mind to go back and forth between this slide and the last slide? Because look at the complexity levels in these two slides. Now, yes. it's certainly there are doctors in each of those major boxes, but for yes. every doctor, there are 40 other people that have to be paid. Yes. In fact, I want to share one slide, one Please. last slide here. And this is actually a scary slide that shows in the last, uh, since 1970, last 50 years, the number of the, the increasing, the number of the physicians versus administration in the United States. Mm. You see, the number of the doctors are maybe doubled or tripled, but the number of the administration, look at that. So wow. that complexity that you showed, is that is what the, the, the big red area is to enable those doctors to oh, go yeah. through a complex system. And so what you're suggesting is not only going to optimize the system yes so the vast majority of the cost in healthcare is actually the the human resource the people that is yes. the expensive part and the doctors are not the majority of that cost there absolutely yes so, um that's a great point you know yeah. and i i want to make a point to thank uh the, the medical students who worked on this project ari august and uh Advit sarikanda at jefferson medical students who you know not only went through the chart but also called the patients and made sure that they understood the full journey of the patient. Um, and, you know, what I think is going to happen is that we're going to continually zoom out in our cost tracking. Eventually, we're going to do time-driven activity-based costing for the entire patient journey and then be able to make improvements and identify bottlenecks. Uh, and that's only going to be possible if the system as a whole is integrated and we're going to be forced to integrate 
when CMS and the employers say, you're going to get this much money for this condition, figure it out, right? And that's suddenly we're going to have to, 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 to kind of get our act together. Um, and I, I think the point you made about administrators is really great. And this is maybe a little, bit, a little bit of a controversial topic, but I find it funny that in hospitals, the hospitals will try and get the surgeons to save money, right? Uh, don't use that. Don't do this. Be faster, whatever the case may be. And a lot of the work that I'm doing is along those lines. But it occurs to me that, you know, there is an entire middle management layer at these hospitals. And we all we all know we'll be on Zoom meetings with with, with these folks. And you kind of wonder to yourself, well, gosh, like uh, these people are probably working from home most of the time. And, you know, how many hours of work do they really do a week? And how much are they getting paid? Uh, and um, and then the question What's becomes, their you know, oh, yeah, ab- absolutely. And they are part of healthcare costs as well, right? Mm-hmm. And so what I think is that one power of this sort of effort is that if you really do time-driven activity-based costing, you really start zooming out, the administrators are going to be part of the process map. Yes. And they're going to be part of the cost. No. And then you're going <laughs> to yeah, and then you're going to say, do we need 17 senior vice presidents for each service line to be able to execute this care? Uh, well, maybe we only need four. You know, so uh, I yeah. see you're getting into trouble already. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Just saying that. Well, one of the things that uh, you know, I said that while, a while back, and uh, nobody really liked that is that you know, all this meeting going from meeting to meeting to meeting. Um, I just want to take care of the patient. Yeah. And most of this administration is to uh, we need administrators to administer the administrators to yes. administer the administrators, right. Right. When it comes to the core of our care, you and I, we can do whatever we can do for to improve the efficiency. Yes. If, if they need for you, 17 people to just for you to deliver your care, that is a different conversation we need to have that for a long time in the United States, it has gone as the chart showed that the administration has become a behemoth that yes. has become a, like a dinosaur that is suffocating under its own weight yes, and become an unsolvable problem. And then all of a sudden, you find five people who find a reason to come back to you with additional thing. what you need to do to just yes. to take care of the patient. Yes. And, and I sometimes ask myself, do, don't you have anything else to do like today? Yes. Don't you have anything else to do? That you, you, you woke up this morning, got your latte, and then decided that this was the the first task of the day. And you know, <laughs> no. And I think this is one reason why, you know, physician led surgical centers and hospitals efficient. are efficient because the people that are making the leadership decisions are also the people in the trenches doing the work. And uh, suddenly, you're only going to have management folks if you absolutely need them. And yeah. and the decision making is going to happen with people that have boots on the ground. And that um, is data. What you just described that physician led um, facilities have higher efficiency, lower complication, and overall better patient yeah. satisfaction. That is yes. statistically proven. Yes. And why do you think that there are so many laws and rules that are preventing of surgeon to be in those positions? And yeah. Physician owned places and so on, they are so shunned. Why do yeah, I, 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 it's a great question? Um, because I think there's, if I, I, I may be a little bit mistaken, I think there's only five states right now in the country with it that uh, technically allow physician owned hospitals. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you know, the obvious answer is that there's a concern about conflicts of interest and in that you're going to drive patients to the facilities that you have ownership in. But it makes me laugh because, uh, and I wrote an essay about this once, which is that. You know, if you're a surgeon that gets paid to do surgeries, that's a conflict of interest. Yes. Right. Hey, you meant to send me that essay. I want to have that essay. Yeah. Please I mean, I mean, me. absolutely. Anyone that's paid, not just surgeons, by P for P for service, where you get paid to provide the service that you are trained to do. Yeah. There's like, a conflict of interest. Like right? pol- police officers, they must yes. solve crime. Because yes. How yes. they get paid or the judges. They yes. want anybody to be a criminal because, right. you know, they're out of a job. Yeah. Out of a job. Now, yeah. 
I love to get them published. We have a magazine called Essence Magazine. I love to oh, publish wonderful. an essay. On oh, Essence yeah. Magazine. But more importantly here, I think you're coming to a very important thing. And I hate to be a conspiracy terrorist, but my theory on that is that the hospitals have better lobbies than the doctors. That is the reason. We're too, we're too busy taking care of patients, right? Yes. <laughs> here you are. Wow. <laughs> Your work is like somebody who does a molecular biology and <laughs> years later, a cure for cancer comes out. Oh, that's people. very nice. Nice of you. Yeah. The job you have done, what I would consider a basic science, necessary basic science, the effect of what you have done will be obvious long, long after you and I are here. Yes. So this is amazing for people who understand that how important it is to get the whale away, get the whale, make it go away for us to be able to look at the data. Yes. Not everybody going to like it. Like, right. I saw two surgeons in your charts that would be, I, I, they, but probably they don't say hello to you anymore. Yeah. <laughs> but, but hundreds of thousands of patients will benefit from this. Yes, yes, okay. yes, absolutely. So we are, I, I could go on and on, but I think we need to come to a conclusion and this has been tremendous. Thank you so much for your, for this fantastic presentation. And we are going to cut it probably in a few segments but uh, you know, it'll be hopefully online available. And everybody who is involved in medicine, in healthcare, in uh, economy, uh, should uh, that this should be a must watch for everybody who's mm -hmm. here. Okay. Thank you. Thank so you so much. much. Amanda? Thank you so much for your time and the platform to talk with you. Thank you. Thank you guys for joining. This was Essence of Medicine. We talked about the economics of spine surgery. I'm Amanda Armagast. And I'm Dr. Arbasi for Essence and our special guest. Hi, uh, Siva Ahilan Sivaganesan. Thanks again.